afternoon, everyone. Again, God has given me the privilege to come to you with his word. Thank God for the privileges of hearing and meditating on God's word. We are always delighted to give to you what God has given to us from his word. We are thankful for uh, the faithfulness of the members of Rising Ebenezer Baptist Church who sponsor this Wednesday noonday Bible teaching. We come to you weekly and we come with joy in our hearts and the anticipation that our Lord is soon to come. So with a great deal of seriousness, we uh, perform, willfully, joyfully perform this duty. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge uh, the great healing that God is placing upon our beloved Deacon Lynn Biddy. He has been ill for a while, but having spoken to his wife early this morning, the praise report was that he is coming along, coming along very well. And for that we are truly uh, thankful. Minister Cooper, as you may or may not know, is preaching back, preaching now, uh, back preaching in our pulpit here uh, at Rising Ebenezer. And for that we are grateful. He was, he was quite ill, but God has given him his strength uh, and his health back. And God is so miraculous and he's the great physician. We have uh, Eugene Palmley. I haven't heard from him in a while, but last report was that he was doing okay. He was driving and, and, and back, uh, doing the job that he loved. And, uh, oh, we are overwhelmed with Thanksgiving. We must also remember that we have Shepherd Johnson who has been ill for a while. And while I haven't heard from him in a few days, I'm going to, if God is willing, try and converse with him as soon as possible. I would like all to thank all of those who are present, uh, who are eagerly awaiting uh, these uh, Bible teachings. Uh, I need your prayers. And if you would subscribe to uh, this Bible teaching, uh, thumbs up, we would certainly appreciate it. We're going to continue to do the best we can in serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's go to God in prayer. Merciful Father, forgive us for our many despicable dastardly sins. Forgive us, Father, for not being patient with your answer to our prayers and our response to our fellow man. Give us the love. Give us the blessed hope that we may journey through this life and especially through this day, being a servant of the Most High God. Again, we thank you for this great privilege, and we certainly want you to bless those who faithfully view this telecast once a week. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Amen. Now we are going to uh, try and catch up, come up to where we are now. We stopped, if 
my memory serves me correct, correctly, we stopped at chapter 25, verse 8 uh, of, of, that, of that chapter. And again, it is our good pleasure to come to you at such a time as this. There is so much chaos, and, and this Pride Month, where men are endorsing laying with men, and women are endorsing laying with women, we are certainly living in the last days, and we must, with one voice, denounce that type of lifestyle we must say God calls it an abomination and all sin, all sexual sin outside of marriage is wrong. And my beloved brothers and sisters, like it or not, you will pay for your sins. And this has been a burden on my heart. To see so many, so many come coming out of the closet. My brothers and sisters, if you read the history of powerful nations in the past, particularly Rome, you will see that the crumbling of their power started when the, the society compromise with this gross gross sin and Pastor Brown and the members of Rising Ebenezer Baptist Church will not endorse such a shameful shameful act having said that I haven't gotten that off my chest let us look now at where we stopped. We stopped, and I said the 8th verse, but actually it was verse 9 of chapter 25. And I would like to bring you up to date, if I may, and let you know uh, where we stand, particularly those who may have missed uh, this section of of the Bible teaching. If you will recall in chapter 21 and we're going to take chapter 21 and come up to chapter 25 in an outline we see in chapter 21 that God gives his commandments. I think we need to go back a little further than that. There you go. Chapter 20. In chapter 20, we see where God has given Moses the Ten Commandments. Now, no society can exist in a civil way unless there are laws, rules, and regulations. And this group of people now known as the nation of Israel also needed rules and regulations and so God gives them laws and the first group of laws are the Ten Commandments he gives them to Moses and then he gives the law of how the Jews were to treat their slaves. Yes, God gave the Jews, gave Israel uh, uh, rules of how to treat slavery in their nation. It was it was the first time laws were made for the slaves. 
in this nation called Israel, the slaves had rights to, which is a, an unusual occurrence in that day as well as these modern times. Not only did he give uh, slaves rights, but he also gave laws for personal injury. He had laws uh, for, in chapter 22, laws for uh, the protection of property. And he also, in verse 23, gave us or gave them laws of justice and mercy. And after reading over some of these, I'm quite sure you uh, saw where the laws that we have in this land, uh, some of them uh, come from these, uh, these laws that God gave to his children. And uh, also in 23, we found out that God uh, anointed Israel to have three annual feasts. He went on to uh, have an angel to lead and prepare the way for his children. But there was a strict rule that they were to obey this angel without swaying to the right or to the left. The penalty for disobeying was extremely severe. And then in chapter 24, we see where Israel agrees with God. And that covenant was confirmed. The people agreed to do everything that God had said in his laws and in his precepts. Now in chapter 25 we see offering offerings for the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle was a place that God wanted them to build and it is a pattern of what heaven heaven's throne room is all about. In this offering, God uh, told the men to willingly give an offering. Now the offering was, came in the form of precious stone. Uh, it was also uh, material of of, of goat hair and uh, wood and and other material that would that would help build the tabernacle and also the furnishings that were inside. And so we come now to this eighth verse of. eighth verse of chapter 25. Now, instead of uh, going through a, a couple of verses, I'm going to sum it up by reading from Hebrews 8 and nine. I want to repeat myself when, um, when saying that in verse nine, the last verse we left off at last time, it said, according to all that I show thee, 
after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. And that was because the tabernacle was a miniature view of heaven. Let's go to Hebrews, if you will. The eighth chapter. And we're going to read from that chapter, verse 5. Who served unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see saith he that thou shalt make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the in the mount because these were heavenly things and a pattern of what heaven looks like. And instead of going back and reading uh, the next three uh, or so chapters, I'm going to summarize the tabernacle and its furnishings in the ninth chapter of Hebrews. The reason I'm doing this is because it uh, reading those verses, those chapters, there's a lot of repeating uh, that takes place, and it is a little tedious. I do invite you to read those chapters, but for those who are following me, I think it would be the prudent thing for us to get an outline of what, or an overview of what the uh, upcoming chapters are all about. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinance of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. There are, uh, in the first room you come to, which is called the holy place, and it, it is divided from the outer court uh, with curtains. But inside uh, this room, you will see the table, the candlestick, and on the table, you will see the showbread. Now coming in, the table with the bread, symbolizing life will be seen on your right side. And then on your left side you will see a candlestick. You, its design is this way. It has a main uh, trunk and from that trunk there are uh, six uh, uh, limbs that come from it that curls upward and on top of each uh, section or limb is a cup. Now this cup was to be uh, uh, filled with oil and it was the duty of the priest 
to keep it burning. This was a symbol of what Israel's purpose was all about. And that is, Israel was supposed to be the light for the heathen world. And yes, we have the candlestick in our modern day churches. In the book of Rev Revelation, we see that Jesus walks through the candlestick. And the candlestick now represents the church. Because all of the action of good, all of the gospel, springs from the source called the church. Now you may be thinking about the church as a building where the saints gather, and you are correct. But you are, you are the church. You are the light of the world now. And so that lamp, lampstick represents uh, that we are the light of the world. And that's called the sanctuary. We have in our church a room of worship, a room of enlightenment, a room where we uh, partake of the bread of life every first Sunday. So we have in our church a section also called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Some call it the holy of holy. The holy, holy of holies. Holiest of holies. I'll get it right after a while. And in this place, the priest only comes in once a year. It is the place where the mediator, who at the time is the high priest, comes in to ask for blessings and to pray and the anointing for the sins of the people. Now it was so holy until the priest had to wash before going in. And there was a rope tied around his ankle. So if he was to die while administering uh, 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 the, 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 the offering from the people, then they would pull him out because you did not go into this room any kind of way. Death would come to those who were not sincere and real and who did not and who did not follow per se the rules of coming into the holy of holies. Holy of Holies. And let me let me go on. Which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold. Within was the golden pot that had manna. Now, I want you to know that there was this there was this chest or box-like object 
And it contained three things. It contained manna, the manna that was given to the children to survive in uh, the wilderness. It had within it uh, the rod of Aaron's uh, 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 staff and it also had the tables of the covenant or the Ten Commandments. So it had the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod which, uh, which uh, he had and, and, and possessed and it also gave us um, the manna, the living bread. Now listen closely to this, verse 5. And over it the cherubims of glory shattered the mercy seat. If you will read in Ezekiel 1 and 10 and also in Revelations you will see that in the throne room of God are creatures called cherubims. They are awesome creatures of great power and in this Holy of Holies we see carved on the lid of this ark cherubims, one on each end, laid over in pure gold, and they are touching each other. This is the shadow of God's mercy. And this mercy seat is none other than the very throne of God. It says in verse 6, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went also into the first tabernacle, accompanying the service of God. But into the second went the high priest. And he went there, what? By himself. Once every year. Not without blood. For he offered for himself and for the arrows of the people. The Holy Spirit, this signifying that the way into the holy holiness of all was not yet made manifest. That's why it was the way it was. While as the first tabernacle was yet standing, these, even the tabernacle itself, was merely a pattern, a shadow of what heaven is. And you see, when Jesus came out of the grave, he told them not to touch him. For he said he had not ascended unto his father. We want to believe that this no touching of Jesus was for him to present his body and the blood that he shed three days earlier on the cross. He was to present it at the altar in heaven. 
That's why you and I are so blessed. We are able to look back at what God's mercy has done for us. We do not have to uh, slit the necks of animals and view that gruesome, awful scene of blood leaving an animal. That's gross. But God had to give us a, a picture of the grossness of sin. It is ugly. It is despicable. But then, so are, are our sins. And so we should what? We should glorify God. We should give Him total praise. And then it goes on to say, which was a figure for the time then pass, in which when offering offered both gifts and sacrifice that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Even the priest could not be made perfect by performing this. Only one person was able to present himself spotless, wrinkleless, perfect, holy, without any blemish nor corruption. And that was our Lord Jesus Christ. This whole section deals with God's desire to worship with us. It is His desire for us to be saved. It is His desire that we come to understand that it's all right. It is all right. All right? To know him as Lord. But we must also know him as our Savior. It must be a personal, personal relationship. Yes, we must know him as God. But we also must know him as Father, a loving, merciful Father. Let me give this and then we will finish up. The Holy Feast, which we have talked about, was the Passover, which speaks of Calvary. The feast of the first fruits, which speaks of his resurrection. The feast of Pentecost, which speaks of his coming spirit. And we see, uh, we will study uh, the other. Uh, Feast, but those are the ones that we have learned of so far. And then I want to talk to you about the purpose of the tabernacle. It was to bring a visible center of worship where the people of Israel could worship God. It was also a preview of Jesus' work here on the cross, uh, on, on his, his uh, earthly ministry. 
And then we look at Moses, who was representative of Christ, our mediator. But Christ was a greater Moses because Moses, like you and I, was a sinful man. We look at the brazen altar and this describes the Lamb of God. We look at the brazen laver. It speaks of the water of life. We look, didn't we, at the table of showbread. It talks about the bread of life. We talked about the altar of incense. It speaks of the prayers of the saints. We talk about the witnesses of the mercy seat. The angels, the cherubims. It speaks of us who are witnesses of Christ's mercy. We are privileged to live in this time frame. And I hope, sincerely hope, that you appreciate what God has done for each of us through His Son, Jesus. This, my brothers and sisters, is an overview of what we have learned from this tabernacle and its furniture. Thank you for listening. We will take up this exciting book of Exodus the next time God gives us privilege to get together. Take care and may God bless is my prayer for each one of you.